Okay, I think we can get started. So uh, welcome to today's webinar. Uh, this webinar is on contactless open payments in transit. And hi, my name is Randy Vanderhoof and I'm the director of the US Payments Forum. And we're an affiliated organization under the Secure Technology Alliance. Today's webinar is going to be recorded and will be available for playback along with the presentation deck shortly after the webinar has concluded. Also, there'll be time at the end for questions, so I encourage listeners to submit their questions using the user dashboard on your screen. I'll return at the end of the presentation to lead the Q&A, and I suggest that you submit questions while the speakers are presenting so that we have time to organize them in advance and so we can get to as many of them as we have time for at the end of the presentation. We can turn to the next slide. For those of you who are not familiar with the U.S. Payments Forum, here's a brief overview. So the forum's mission is to be a cross-industry body focused on supporting the introduction and implementation of EMV and other new and emerging technologies that protect the security of and enhance opportunities for payment transactions in the U.S. The focus of the organization has evolved over the last few years from being singularly dedicated to EMV and its migration into the U.S. market to a much broader focus on other technologies beyond the card and EMV transaction flow. Our work supporting the continued adoption of EMV continues for the late maturing segments of the retail market, such as the petroleum industry and hospitality and transit, which is the focus of today's session. Increased ed attention on education and addressing issues affecting payments that go beyond DMV, like mobile payment and tokenization, authentication, biometrics, future CDM developments, and emerging standards addressing e-commerce channels like 3D secure technology, secure remote commerce, and new fraud mitigation tools to combat card not, card not present fraud are part of the discussions of the current U.S. Payments Forum activities. We go to the next slide. The U.S. Payments Forum brings together in an open forum of equals across the payments ecosystem, leading companies representing the global payment brands, financial payment issuers, merchants, processors, debit networks, mobile services providers, and other industry suppliers, integrators, and associations, including government and the transportation operators. The way the forum operates is we hold a number of collaboration projects uh, to develop resources to assist um, in both the U.S. EMV migration and the implementation of these other payment technologies using white papers and educational resources developed by the working committees and developing best practices and technical recommendations. We also provide education programs such as this to our members and to those outside in the industry, including webinars, workshops, as well as at the forum meetings, we have uh, uh, tutorials and, and provide explanations of other published resources. We have an outreach program for communications to the market on some of these uh, active developments in the payments industry through our newsletters and through our web resources, and then um, one of the benefits of being part of a multi-industry stakeholder organization is there's ample opportunity for networking with other industry colleagues to address issues and to raise concerns to, in order to solve problems that we're facing with today's market. For anyone who's interested in more information about our members, our working committees, the various white papers and other resources we've published, um, please visit our website at www uspaymentsforum.org. Next slide, please. So now I'd like to introduce you to today's speakers. Steve Cole is a senior product manager for EMV at WorldPay, a leading provider of payment processing services and related technology solutions for merchants and financial institutions of all sizes. In his role, he is responsible for product development of the EMV program for WorldPay's merchant customers and assisting merchants and WorldPay software partners with navigating the EMV certification process. He is a steering committee member of the U.S. Payments Forum and an active member of the Transit Contactless Open Payments Working Committee and was the co-lead on the development of today's webinar. Atai Sella is the CEO of V2 Payments USA, a company he established to help the U.S. 
migration to EMV. Over the past 17 years, Mr. Sella has become a subject matter expert in the payments industry, specializing in smart card technology related to EMV, fraud, risk management, cryptography, contactless and NFC technologies, and e-commerce. He is also a steering committee member of the U.S. Payments Forum and an active member of the Transit Contactless Open Payments Working Committee. Next slide, please. So we're gonna start off the webinar with Steve Cole from WorldPay, and then Ite Sala from B2 will follow Steve and they'll hand off to one another at different sections of today's presentation. So Steve? Thank you, Randy. And thanks and welcome to all of you for joining today's webinar, Contactless Open Payments for Transit. Next slide, please. The uh, contents of today's presentation will include the following topics. We'll detail the purpose and the scope of the presentation, which will provide a baseline of how open payments may work in the U.S. transit environment. Um, we'll also introduce today's closed loop uh, payment market uh, for transit. We'll share some data around the U.S. transit market. Uh, we'll also explain what transit open payments are, which will include details of the benefits and challenges of open payments for the transit industry. Um, we'll address some common use cases for transit, and then finally we'll conclude with the U.S. Payment Forum working, uh, Transit Working Committee's approach to developing a solution for implementing open payments in transit and what's next uh, for transit open payments. Next slide, please. Uh, the, what is the purpose and scope of this presentation? Uh, today's presentation is to educate stakeholders on transit open payments. Specifically, our intent is to provide a baseline understanding of how EMV contactless open payments may work in the U.S. transit environment from a technology perspective. Throughout this presentation, we'll focus on the card as the contactless form factor for some simplicity reasons. However, other contactless form factors, such as mobile devices and wearables, can also be used in transit open payment solutions. Uh, this presentation is intended to provide you with a basis for understanding the general concept of contactless open payments and transit with a foundation for exploring the concept in more depth. Uh, the focus is on payments made at transit points of entry, uh, such as fare gates and front door boarding of buses. Uh, also note that while there are several other contactless payment technologies today, such as radio frequency, Bluetooth low energy, uh, QR and barcodes, MSD contactless and MST, which is MagStripe secure transaction contactless. This presentation will only address EMB contactless with, e with NFC. Now I'll turn it over to Etai to review the transit market, uh, transit payments today, uh, transit open payments and the benefits of open payments and transit. Etai. Yeah, thanks, Steve, and hi, everyone. So <clears throat> I'm going to start uh, with the U.S. transit market. And if you look at the market itself, uh, the public transit ridership has, gro has been growing over the past two decades. There are uh, 10.6 billion trips were taken across all modes of transit in the U.S., with revenue totally nearing 16 billion in the U.S. in 2015. Cash is still the most prevalent method of payment for mass transit. And riders also indicate a strong demand for alternate payments such as credit and debit cards and mobile payments. Open payments could help reduce cash transactions and provide transit riders with more payment options. Issuers have incentives to issue dual interface cards based on the volume of transactions that can be added by supporting open payments in transit. Next slide, please. The transit market today uh, is comprised of a closed loop payment system in which a transit fare card is obtained by the rider. This transit fare card is used to pay for trips throughout the transit system. The transit card needs to be loaded with a value using payments, payment in advance via a ticket vending machine or a window. This is done by using a payment card such as a credit, debit, or prepaid card to load value into the transit card. The transit card is inserted into the kiosk and the value selected to be loaded on the card by the card holder is added to the transit card once the payment card used for the transaction has been authorized. To pay for a trip, the transit card is presented at the point of entry where the fare is calculated and deducted 
from the transit card and or the transit account is being updated. So next slide, please. Now let's look at uh, what are open payments and how we will benefit from them. So transit merchants are looking to deploy retail-like open payment systems. These offer the potential for financial transactions to shift from payment in advance to direct payment at the point of entry, such as turnstiles or fare gates when a customer is ready to travel. Open payments eliminates the need for customers to obtain fare media and prepay for transit service. This, however, could pose a greater risk for transit merchants as authentication and payment is less certain than closed loop fare media they have today. With open payments, we are referring to using your typical bank issued payment card at transit points of entry. These are the same cards that you'd use to pay for your groceries and gas or any other type of merchant vertical. In order to be used at transit points of entry, these cards will need to be dual interface. This means that they can be used as contact cards where the card is inserted into a card reader or as a contactless card where the card is tapped on the reader itself. For transit points of entry, they will be used as contactless only uh, in order to achieve uh, faster transaction speed. Next slide, please. There are many benefits of supporting open payments in the transit points of entry environment for both the customer and the merchant. For the customer, they are able to use their contactless EMV payment card that is already in their wallet. This allows them a seamless acceptance experience in transit just like it would in any other merchant vertical where contactless EMV is supported. There is no need to use or pre-fund a special purpose transit card or other fair media for entry. This means there is no need to stop at a kiosk to top up a special purpose card or purchase a ticket prior to heading to the point of entry. Travelers do not need to carry cash and can easily move between transit operators. Next slide, please. For the transit merchant, there are just as many benefits, if not more, than for the customer. Some of the opera operational benefits are that the terminal and merchant system hardware and software are ideally off the shelf as they use the global EMV standard. The system can be more effect effic effectively updated as payment technologies evolve. It can support additional granularity of data for analysis to enhance the consumer experience. It can support flexibility in managing pricing and establishing partnerships among entities and it can retain the ability to accept and process closed loop payments. Next slide. Fine. Uh, sorry, in addition to these operational benefits, transit merchants may see benefits due to simplified fair payment process of open payment. Moreover, contactless can increase the speed of customer throughput, which in turn improves customer satisfaction. Using contactless payment cards will also prepare customers for contactless payments using mobile devices. And finally, Accepting open payments increase, increases the range of payment options for transit customers to use. Uh, at this point, I'd like to hand it over back to Steve to cover the Transit for London customer experiences and transit open payment consideration. Tra uh, TFL, which stands for uh, Transport of London, runs a very comprehensive uh, open payments transit system in London in the United Kingdom. Um, over 77% of riders are highly satisfied with the use of contactless cards mainly because of the advantages, which you see on the screen, that open contactless payment cards and, um, provide, which include the ease of use, uh, saves time as there's no need to top up uh, a special purpose card, allows the customer to use their, the payment card of their preference at the point of entry, and it also leads to less cards having to be carried by the, the consumer since they don't have to carry that special purpose transit card. Uh, the TFL also did some research in, in 2014 that showed 69% of commuting rail passengers without a season ticket traveling into London would, rather, would be very interested or interested in, in contactless payments. This means that a standard contactless EMV payment card or an equivalent on a mobile device uh, such as a wearable or a watch um, can be used for all points of entry to the transit system. The same payment card can be used for all transit modes, whether it's the underground, buses, commuter trains, uh, any of those throughout London. The rider has the same experience in all points of entry. These points um, are in addition to all the other benefits of contactless payments cards, which includes uh, security and transparency of the payment, uh, ease of traveling between transit operators, and usability of different form factors such as cards, mobile devices, and wearables. 
Next slide, please. So there are definitely benefits to contactless open payments, but there are some consideration and challenges as well. Uh, now, open contactless payments enable transit agencies to provide their ridership with a user experience similar to that of the retail sector. While riders benefit from this consistent experience, the unique requirements and operating environments of the transit industry present some unique challenges for the agencies. Unlike the retail sector, uh, point of sale readers, reader devices on board buses and subways typically experience intermittent uh, connectivity uh, with the host as they move about the service area. As such, um, agencies can't always rely on back office systems for payment uh, transaction risk management processes. And in addition to that, the transit industry requires <clears throat> rapid speed of throughput at the points of entry, and this requirement in most instances uh, prevents the agencies from securing an online authorization prior to the go-no-go -go customer prompt, um, which usually can take three to six seconds. Given these considerations, agencies are adopting offline techniques to help them mitigate the risk associated with these payment transactions. Next slide, please. In addition to the intermittent reader connectivity and near real-time authorizations, agencies are also foregoing the use of PIN or signature at the points of entry. However, these are primary tools for helping merchants reduce risk associated with payment card acceptance. In lieu of the risk mitigation techniques used in the retail environment, transit agencies are managing their risk through the use of dynamic offline data authentication. This is where the card and the device authenticate um, that the payment form factor is gen genuine. And they also use local deny lists, which is a listing of bad card numbers stored locally at the reader level. Uh, however, deny lists do require frequent updating by the agency to add new cards um, that have experienced declines or to remove a previously bad card if they've gotten a successful uh, debt recovery authorization. Um, together though, these risk mitigation methods coupled with enhanced operating policies uh, enable the transit industry to accept contactless payments while managing the risks associated with, pay with payment acceptance. Next slide, please. Another consideration for transit open payments involves the calculation of the fare for each customer for each trip. Uh, many agencies have fare prices that vary based on various factors in including uh, location, time of the day, type of service used over the journey um, on the subways and buses and trains. Uh, for example, a customer may take a trip that involves first riding a subway then leaving the subway to transfer to a bus in order to get to their final destination. And in many cities, the customer would pay a base fare for the subway ride but then be eligible for a free or discounted price for the continuation when boarding the bus. Um, other examples include um, pricing based on the distance traveled. Uh, this is often um, by the customer tapping when entering the system and then tapping again when leaving at the end of their, their ride. Um, there's also pricing based on the time of day. Often customers are charged a higher fare during peak periods of morning and evening rush hours. So these are examples of actual fare for a journey that may not necessarily be known at the time of the first tap, as transit merchants often need to perform processing of multiple taps for a given card before accurately pricing the fare owed by the customer. A related characteristic of open payment transactions is that they're usually low value transactions, so that could vary by city or region. Um, and additionally, transit fares are off are offered on both uh, single fare bases, that's where that's where you're paying for each journey individually, and volume based discounts, in which the customers taking multiple rides over a given time period are eligible to pay one discounted bulk fare for all journeys over the course of a day or a week or a month. Um, next slide, please. Uh, one of the most significant uh, technical considerations of implementing open payments is the time required to perform 
a real-time online contactless transaction. Um, based on some statistics provided by Consult Hyperion, a typical retail transaction can take from 2.8 seconds to over 6.8 seconds to complete, and parts of the transaction are not within the transit merchant's control. So the transaction starts with the transit terminal processing where the interaction uh, between the card and the reader typically takes from 250 to 300 milliseconds for a high performance crypto processing chip. And this may take longer for slower uh, chips as is shown on the slide. The transit merchant may also experience a latency in the round trip communication from the card reader to the back office and for bus operations uh, the public mobile networks will also be a factor in uh, in the uh, communication lag. The transaction then moves out of the transit merchant's environment to the acquirer and then on to the payment network and to the issuer. This part of the transaction which the merchant doesn't have any control over may take as much as two to five seconds. The authorization response is then returned to the transit merchant's environment, and then the transaction is sent back to the transit terminal for completion. For these uh, transit environments, the only CVM, which stands for cardholder verification method, used is no CVM. As mentioned earlier, um, they wouldn't be using PIN or, or signature. So there will be no prompting for PIN entry, which that does help um, the transaction speed and the overall throughput. Um, this part of the process also includes uh, any go or no-go messaging to the customer and opening the gate in, in gated environments. And now I'd like to turn it back over to Itai um, to go over our solution approach and review some of the use case process flows. Thanks, Steve. Okay, so let's look at the uh, different transaction flows uh, that the U.S. Payments Forum solution approach is, is handling. So in developing this proposed solution, the U.S. Payments Forum Transit Working Committee worked to ensure that the transit payment experience would be as secure as any other EMV chip transaction. The committee utilizes the three pillars of a secure transaction, which include card authentication, cardholder verification, and financial authorization while balancing these against the unique requirements of the transit payment environment. There were a couple of important key assumptions that were used in developing the proposed solution, and they had to do with the offline environment that, the, that is a reality for transit operators and making sure that the existing EMV standard is not deviated from for any of the three pillars discussed. Uh, two main flows were covered, uh, known fare and transit ag aggregation distance-based flows. And let's start with the uh, known fare. So this model has been proposed for any transit environment where there is no aggregation and a known fee is charged based on the actual value for the specific trip. Under this proposal, the card is presented at the point of entry terminal. If ODA, which stands for offline data authentication is successful and the card is not on the deny list, the gate will be open. Please note that ODA for transit is only used to prove that the card is genuine and to open the gate. There are no payments that take place at this point in the transaction. Payment will take place using standard deferred online authorization or real-time authorization. There is a settlement record for each individual transaction that is authorized. If a transaction is declined and the client was allowed to travel, the transaction can be reauthorized and settled at a later stage. You should refer to the branch specific rules regarding debt recovery and any applicable dollar limit above which settlement is not permitted if authorization is declined. These are also known as declined authorization limits. In case of a denial, transit merchants should add the card to the deny list until debt recover is successful. Next slide, please. So in transit aggregation or distant baits, transaction flow, the model has been proposed for any transit environment where there is aggregation or where the actual cost of the trip might be distance based. For this, the card is presented at the point of entry terminal. If ODA is successful and the card is not on the deny list, the gate is open. The transaction is then forwarded to the transit back office system to follow the aggregated model as per individual brand rules. If it is the first time for travel for a specific card, the transit merchant will perform an account verification request or pre-authorization 
based on each payment brand's business model. If the transaction is declined, the agency will put the card on the deny list to prevent further travel. If the account verification pre-authorization was approved, the transaction may be aggregated for the day's travel. There will be one settlement record for all the transactions that were performed during that day. Next slide, please. <clears throat> The end of day settlement process for both the known fare and aggregation solution proposed in this presentation will depend on whether authorization is successful and whether a declined authorization limit has been imposed. If the authorization for the individual or combined transaction is approved, the transit merchant will submit the transaction for settlement. If the authorization is declined and either the transaction is below the declined authorization limit, if any, or there is no declined authorization limit, then the transaction would be settled, the card would be put on the deny list, the debt recovery process would be followed to get a positive approval for the original travel amount, and once the approval is received, the authorization would be reversed as the transit merchant was already paid, and the card would be removed from the deny list. If the authorization is declined and the transaction is above the declined authorization limit, if any, then the card would be put on the deny list, and once the approval is received, the transaction would be settled and the card would be removed from the deny list. So at the end, I'd like to send it back to Steve for one last time to discuss what is next in transit open payments. Steve? Thank you, Itai. Next slide, please. So um, what is next in for transit open payments? Uh, first, the payment networks are finalizing their transit solutions and rules for the U.S. region. Um, also, the U.S. Payments Forum um, established the Transit Working Committee that, that not only put together uh, this uh, the content for this presentation, but uh, other documentation as well, is working on addressing the unique challenges around the transit vertical um, and helping to provide guidance to the U.S. transit market. Uh, currently, there are several U.S. and trans Canadian transit agencies accepting contactless open payments, including uh, CTA in Chicago, uh, TriMet in Portland, and TransLake in uh, Vancouver, British Columbia. Uh, these agencies, however, deployed prior to the development of the Transit Working Committee's uh, technical solutions and do not follow all aspects of the committee's proposed solution. Additionally, there are num numerous other cities and regions in North America actively moving forward with contactless open payments initiatives. And in order to help guide the U.S. contactless transit market, the Transit Working Committee has published or is working to publish uh, the following documents. Uh, the first one was Use Case 1, which is pay as you go with a card. That has been published. Uh, use Case 2 is pay as you go with a mobile. That has also been published. Uh, implementation guidelines for open uh, loop in transit. Um, that is in progress. And also Use Case 3, which is pay as you go aggregation, which is also in, in process. Additional use cases and documents may also be considered in the future, and you can get a copy of any of the published use cases on the U.S. Payments, Payments uh, Forum's website. Next slide, please. Um, finally, um, I would like to, to thank the, um, the members who contributed to the uh, the creation of this webinar, the U.S. Um, Payments Forum is made up of members who work on a voluntary basis. Uh, those who took part um, in this project that we'd like to thank for their efforts are, in addition to myself and Itai Mansour Karimzada, who is the uh, other co-lead on this project, uh, Amy Linden from MTA, Elisa Tavia from the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston, Christopher Brummer from Visa, and then from Discover, Peter Rock, Bert Wilhelm, Shanna Meehan, and Brianne Pigeon. And now I'd like to turn it over to Randy uh, to lead us through the Q&A portion of our webinar. Thank you, Steve, and thank you, Atai, for your great uh, presentations on this Transit Payments webinar. Um, but before we get to your questions, I just wanted to highlight a couple of new additional resources from the U.S. Payments Forum. So if we can go to the next slide. Um, I wanted to let you know that uh, we have an upcoming U.S. Payments Forum member meeting uh, being held July 17th and 18th, 2019 in Atlanta. 
And then our final uh, member meeting will be November 21, 22, I'm sorry, 20th and 21st um, in St. Louis. At these uh, member meetings are working committees, including the Transit Open Loop Payments uh, Working Committee, will be working together on next steps in uh, developing these recommendations and best practices and answering the questions that come in from the issuing community as well as from the, the, the transit operators themselves. Um, also, there are several white papers that have been published um, related to transit contactless open payments. Um, and this particular webinar was built on this white paper on technical solutions for pay as you go. Uh, and you can access that white paper through the link that appears on your screen, or you can go to the US Payments Forum site and search on those resources that are available as well. Um, now, if we can go to the next slide, um, we'll leave our contact information up while we go through the Q&A for the next few minutes. Um, the first question I have is um, um, for Steve Cole, uh, and that question is, um, there's a, a challenge in transit open payments. The benefit of the delayed online authorization means that if the terminal goes offline, the device or terminal interaction will still go ahead, and the data itself though it may be delayed, um, will not be lost and can still proceed. Is this challenge being met? So that's, I believe that what they're trying to get to there is whether, um, you know, deferred authorization is a, um, a solution for, for open transit payments, and, and, and it is. So the, the decision to open the, the, the gate based on the card using the offline data authentication to, um, to, to, to prove that the card is genuine and open the gate, at that time, um, the, the, um, the payment information can also be captured, but it can be sent online later so that um, that, that process is not delaying the opening of the gate itself, as I believe is what they were asking. Okay, thank you. Next question is for Atai. Um, will contactless card payments make mobile payments obsolete like Apple Pay? Um, no, actually, they, they kind of go hand in hand together. So it really just gives um, an additional form factor for the card holders to be able to decide what they want to use. Um, First of all, not everybody has an Apple Pay or a Google Pay phone. So for those situations, obviously, the card as a uh, standard form factor that everybody has, whether they have a debit or a prepaid, would be useful. Um, so really, we don't see the cards cannibalizing on mobile, uh, but we just see that as another form factor that enables uh, card holders to have a choice as to which contactless uh, form factor they'll use in order to transact at a transit uh, operator. Okay, um, but Ty, I think you can answer this next question as well. Um, what considerations uh, to transit system operators um, have for taking, for having EMV readers at their acceptance gates and their buses, um, such as PCI compliance? Are they the same requirements as general merchants? Um, yes, they would be. Um, I mean, obviously, there may be some uh, um, some specific uniqueness to uh, how the transaction is flowing. And, you know, just kind of going back to the first question of where the data is actually stored, um, you know, that has obviously some uh, PCI compliance requirements. Um, it just really depends on how the um, transit operator is going to implement. Uh, what we see is, uh, you know, standard readers specifically for contactless only where the majority or if not all of the transaction information is actually passed in real time, even though the gate is open or you can board the bus, all the transaction data is then sent to the back office where it is today as well, which puts that into scope as well from a PCI perspective. And then really the deferred authorization is a matter of seconds. It's not very similar to like a deferred authorization that we would have in a normal merchant that is doing what we call stand in where they're keeping it for a few minutes or maybe hours and only then sending it. So, um, you know, we need to achieve performance um, at these point of entries uh, in between two or 300 milliseconds, and that is key. And so we're decoupling the authentication of the card with the authorization of the card or phone 
um, between this transaction. So PCI will definitely be there, part of the EMV and uh, contactless certifications from the brands will also be part of that. Um, so very similar to a retail-like uh, environment requirements. Thanks, Atai. Um, Steve, you can handle this one. Um, in in your uh, presentation language, you referred to um, uh, payment transactions being routed through the brand. Um, but um, were you implying that uh, that payment card transactions are only able to work in open loop systems through the global brands like Visa and MasterCard? Well, no, uh, but there are certainly challenges with um, doing the debit routing, uh, but there's nothing that, that precludes them from a rules perspective, um, but there there's probably some, you know, unique technical challenges within the transit environment around debit routing, but it certainly isn't um, pre precluded by rule. And, and Randy, I, I would just add to that that the same challenges that debit ha that U.S. debit has for contact list and any other retail or merchant space would apply to transit. So it's not that transit brings something unique um, to other routing. It's it's just the industry routing as a whole for contact list, which now transit is using contact list obviously becomes one of those um, environments of challenges, right? So we, we just should say that there's no there's transit doesn't create something unique um, for that. Uh, for that process. From an, I would say, from an authorization perspective, obviously there's the whole back office and how do you uh, make sure that you, you know, deferred authorization with debit, of course, but the routing piece, which is uh, upfront is, is the same. Thank you. And I, and I would add for both of you that the, that discussion in particular um, is often raised at our U.S. Payments Forum meetings and uh, people are working very hard to address what those complexities are and trying to work for uh, solutions to make sure that uh, those routing issues uh, are not a problem in transit. Uh, this next question, um, actually I don't know either. One of you can, can uh, answer this one. Um, when the EMV card is first presented and not on the denied list, you mentioned initial authorization. What does that look like to the customer with prepaid cards or debit cards who might have a dollar value constraint on their payment card? Steve, you want to take that or you want me to take it? <laughs> Why don't you go ahead and take a take okay. first shot? Okay. So um, let, let's, let's separate uh, kind of this let's separate the answer into two parts. Um, so the, the first part, and this actually goes to the same exact point I was making about uh, debit, not specifically about the routing, but the back off. When we pre-authorize, so if the, if the card is not on the denial list and we end up doing a, a, a initial authorization um, and there's no funds, remember that we're not doing this uh, in order to open the gate. So if there's nothing on the denial list, the authentication of the card is successful, the gate will open and the rider will be able to pass. The, the issue is, is when we try to pre-authorize that um, in advance or authorize it as a pay-as-you-go, and there is a denial because there's only $1 on a prepaid or a debit card, um, that becomes a brand-specific rule. And this is one of the things that the brands, each brand is, is, is working as part of their business requirements as to what to do because there are specific discussions around what are the issuer's um, guarantees or the brand guarantees to the transit merchants for first cap risk, which is similar to what this is. Um, so we can't really go into that because that's more of a competitive environment with each of the brands and uh, transit merchants should uh, uh, should talk to their acquirer and through the brands uh, figure out what that looks like for each of those products. Uh this next question I'll address to Steve. Um, so closed loop card systems um, are particularly uh, flexible in supporting uh, account-based ticketing for distance-based fares, daily, weekly, monthly fare capping, and, and other discounts. Are open loop cards equally as flexible as their closed loop uh, alternatives? I would say that they are um, because you know with the closed loop um, 
cards, you're essentially loading value onto the card that then you go and you use it for your for your travel. But with the open loop cards, you know your 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 value is determined by you know your what you have in your checking account or what you know your line of credit is. So that value is already there, so you can use it in in the same same way. Um, I, I would think maybe one advantage of closed loop systems is um, from a loyalty perspective, you may have a better vision of that customer because because of it being a closed loop system than you might um, with with open loop payments where they may be using different cards at different times. But from you know paying the fares themselves, um, it, it should provide that same functionality. And I, I would add to that that it's a it's a back end settlement um, capability that's being built into the open loop payment uh, processing systems uh, to be able to determine what uh, discounts and or uh, fair uh, schedules are are applied for those specific transactions based on date and time and other other criteria. Yeah, and Randy, maybe just to add on top of that, one of the things we're looking at as a group is also the um, tokenization as well, because um, you can register uh, a specific open loop card um, and then, you know, kind of provide all the same loyalties. But once that card is being used as a card or as a phone or as a wearable, uh, they actually have different um, device pans. And so that makes a challenge of identifying who that customer is to grit, to create the loyalty. Um, so. That's one of the other things the working group is working on as well to, to try to find solutions for that. Thanks, and uh, I'll direct this question to Atai since it's based on the, um, the TFL, the sample um, that was given earlier. Um, uh, so uh, in Europe, uh, there's a requirement to enter a PIN when using their EMD contactless cards. Um, how did TFL get away with um, not re requiring that uh, for their use. Um, so, okay, so I'm not sure if this question has to do with the uh, PSD2 uh, uh, secure authentication uh, requirements that are coming in, um, but even those uh, are specific, the, the rules are this in Europe, let's just say what they are right now. So you cannot do a contact-based transaction um, without a PIN, but in transit we don't have contact-based transactions, so there's no issue there. Um, for contactless-based transactions, you may do a, a single transaction up to $50, which most transit transactions are under, or you can do an aggregated of, I think it's three to five transactions and no, long, no more than 150. So in that case, unless that aggregation of the PIN meets those within a transit environment, uh, that could stop that. But, uh, but other than that, because it's low-value transactions, usually it's... Uh, it's it's under that uh, transaction threshold, and therefore they can tap the card without a pin. Okay. Uh, let's see here. So this question, I guess I'll leave it for Steve or Atai. Uh, EMV cards. Can is used by the transit agency as the customer's token to travel. Do you have any recommendations to transit agencies on how to ensure customer service layers can remain outside the PCI scope but handle the PAN as a token? So that's really two questions. One, um, ha what happens when a mobile device is used and the PAN is tokenized? And two, um, when the PAN is actually presented in a contactless card, would um, there be any exposure to PCI scope uh, at the payment terminal? Yes, yeah, so I think that goes back to a couple of Itai's prior comments, um, you know, that uh, using mobile devices where the PAN's being tokenized, that's a recognized issue and, and one that's being discussed at the forum um, um, to try and figure out solutions for that. And then, Two, um, certainly if they do have the, the underlying PAN in the system, that is, you know, definitely puts that into PCI scope. Okay. Uh, Atai, can an EMV chip profile that doesn't support offline transactions be used at a transit turnstile? 
Okay, so I, I'd like to make sure I, re, I reiterate that question into something uh, so that I can explain it. So I want let, let's just talk about the difference between um, supporting offline transactions and supporting offline authentication, which is dynamic data authentication, which is the minimum required, um, if not CDA, obviously, for contactless. So a card does not have to have any offline authorization capabilities whatsoever. So basically means the issuer doesn't have to do all the offline risk management and floor limits and all the other capabilities that the card has or the mobile phone has or any profile has. But what they do have to have in order for the uh, uh, customer to be able to use their contactless form factor at a, trans at a transit point of entry is offline data authentication. So as long as the card supports dynamic offline data authentication, fast DDA or CDA, depending on the brand, um, that, that is the minimum requirement to get through, uh, through the point of entry, and, and that's all that will need to be done as part of the profile. Uh, to say the least, it's not simple, but that, that is the minimum requirement um, as part of that uh, profile. Thank you. Steve, uh, you mentioned that uh, next up for transit open payments, one of the things was that the networks are finalizing the transit solutions and rules. Can you tell me what might be some of the rules that we would anticipate hearing from um, from the networks? Yeah, so while I won't comment on, on specific network rules, um, the rules um, that they would be looking at would be around things like the um, the use of offline authentication uh, as a possibility, also aggregation um, and the impacts of that on um, open payments. Um, but each of the brands has, um, you know, their uh, their transit solutions are at different stages of evolution, so it's a little bit different for each. And I, I didn't, I wouldn't want to comment on on specific brands and, and what they're doing. Okay, thank you. So the the, the point is is that uh, um, for the unique handling of uh, the payment card transactions with the offline terminals, and then the aggregation of of various small value transactions, um, there is some there's expectation that uh, there may be some rules that specifically address the needs of the transit industry. Is that pretty accurate? Yes. Okay, um, I think we have one more question here that wasn't already answered. Um, so it, maybe this was answered already, but how will transact, transit operators prevent fraud on uh, the use of tokens, and will the terminals be updated to receive the par value from the device? So I think as far as the fraud, right, we're still looking for, you know, the offline data authentication to um, validate that it's a genuine card. And that process would occur regardless of whether a token is being used or not. If I'm following the question correctly, I guess Steve, they're asking uh, how do you do the denial lists with a token when you have a different pen, and that's why we need the bar. Um, yeah, this is this is still one of the one of the discussions that we're still having because that is a very good question and uh, and one of the challenges uh, around the tokenization uh, component. Again, not for the card because the card has the real pen, so it's easy. It's only when we have a device pen coming from a, a mobile phone or a wearable. Um, uh, which is still being discussed. So that's definitely still one of the challenges uh, that, that the working group is still working on. So I think we'll end on that question, but I would also encourage the audience that this type of discussion is uh, is going to be had in future meetings by the, the working committee. And so uh, please stand by for further uh, announcements and publications from the U.S. Payments Forum on this issue. 
Uh, and then I would also encourage, of course, any of folks who would be interested in participating in these discussions to consider uh, becoming a member of the U.S. Payments Forum and, and participating in that way. So I want to thank you all for participating in today's webinar, and special thanks go to our presenters, Steve Cole from WorldPay and Itai Sella from D2 uh, for today's webinar, and all of the contributors mentioned earlier who helped uh, put this content together for the webinar. Um, this contact information above is uh, available to anyone who would like to follow up with questions for Steve, Atai, or myself. Uh, and you can certainly contact me and provide any feedback on what you felt uh, came from today's webinar. Uh, as a reminder, the webinar is being recorded and it will be available for playback along with the presentation deck after the webinar is concluded. And you'll receive an email with a link where you can listen to the recording and download this presentation. Also, we encourage you to share that link in, uh, with other members in your organization who are unable to join us today, uh, and hopefully uh, we will get to spread more of this information to a broader audience. So this concludes today's webinar. Thank you all, and have a great day.